I see a very clear path for Mark Evans and Shaq Davis to make the Saints 53-man roster. Oh, yeah, it's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked on HBCU podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked on podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember... Just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives, which you can see right here at the bottom of the screen. But if you don't see it, that just means you're on the audio side of things. And I appreciate you too. Actually, today's episode is dedicated to my audio listeners. I got a nice little email about my audio listeners today. So you know what? Today's episode is dedicated to you truly and specially. Thank you. Now, today's is going to wrap up with... Joe Bryan, he's taken yet another massive step in his offseason journey on the way from Norfolk State to hopefully, fingers crossed, the NBA. Before we get into that, we're going to dive into a little bit of sports psychology, looking at external pressure versus internal pressure, because I feel like I've discussed pressure a little bit on this show over the last couple of weeks, and I want to dive in a little bit deeper on my psychological view of it, right? But before any of it, before any of that, you see these things behind me, Saints, TSU, not quite TSU, but just HBCUs. Work with me, right? I'm painting a picture here. Saints, HBCUs. I love it when those two things mesh, and they did this offseason after the NFL draft. Shaq Davis, Mark Evans, they both signed undrafted free agent contracts with my team, with my New Orleans Saints, and I'm going to tell you what. I believe in about three, four months when the season starts, we could see both of these players on the New Orleans Saints 53-man roster. That is the ceiling for the wide receiver out of South Carolina State and the offensive lineman out of University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. These two players are special, and I'm going to dive into it because, listen, I'm talking about ceilings. That means if everything goes well, I'm going to outline the path to the 53-man roster for sure. I'm not going to just say it's going to be the case and then move on. I want to tell you how does he get there. How does Shaq Davis, how does Mark Evans get to the 53-man roster? But I'll tell you what as a little bit of a – insurance a little bit of a floor I see these guys as at least practice squad players I don't think that's a stretch at all and if that isn't the case it's not from being overlooked see look I can't go through every single player who was undrafted a is a lot of them b I just don't have the situation or I don't really understand the situation of every single one of the 32 teams the way I do my saints so because this is my team I feel uniquely positioned to be able to discuss exactly what I see in the future for Mark Evans and Shaq Davis. So that's why I'm going to do it. But I will say this for my everydayers out there. If there is a player who you really want me to look at his situation, drop him in the comments below. If you drop him in the comments below, I will talk about him on Monday, Tuesday, depending on how many people get dropped. Drop that. Okay. with that being said, I want to first off tell you why there is so much confidence around Evans and Davis. Now, both of these players were the highest paid players for the New Orleans Saints undrafted free agent class with Evans getting and listen, I don't really like to count people pockets. I promise you it's not my forte. But when it comes to sports contracts, it's kind of part of the job description and it's public information. So am I really counting his pockets? Maybe. But sue me. Right. That's, I think that's what people say. <laughs> but when I'm looking at Mark Evans, he made two hundred and forty one thousand dollars guaranteed in his undrafted free agent contract. That was number one of all New Orleans Saints UDFAs. When you look at Shaq Davis, he made $216,000 guaranteed. That's tied for second. But basically, these are the two top paid players because if you want to put three, if you want to be technical about it, but these are really the two top numbers, 216, 241. So I'll put it like this. You can do this with your own team. Look at your UDFAs of your professional team. 
the ones who are paid the most, those are the ones who have the highest investment. Those are the ones who I view as being the most valued by the team coming into camp. Now, at this point, with Davis and Evans being one and two, if you want to say two A, two B, that's fine. But one of the top three at the worst, depending on how you order it. If they don't make a practice squad, it's not from being overlooked. The ball is now in their court and they have the ability to now control their own destiny in a way. But let's look at Mark Evans because I feel like his is a little bit easier to explain. With Evans, a lot of people view Evans as the best HBCU player coming out of the draft this year. A lot of people did. Matter of fact, my guy Ross, family of the show, not friend of the show, but real family member, fellow family member with you and I, this is a guy who on Tuesday morning, Ross, if I got it wrong, I'm sorry, but you know, you do a lot of these. So <laughs> I believe it was a Tuesday morning episode in which he discussed Mark Evans and Shaq Davis and where he feels like they could excel in the team. So make sure you check out Locked on Saints as well. But here I'm going to dive specifically into our two players with no focus on anyone else. So with Mark Evans, you're looking at a player who, you know, many thought he could have been the first overall or excuse me, the first HBCU player drafted, ended up not being drafted. Okay, I already thought that the Saints should bring in Mark Evans as a draft pick. So the fact that they got him as a UDFA, I was through the roof. You know, if I was one of the people who exposed text messages, I would show you the text messages where I said Mark Evans and the Saints should be a pairing, right? Not exactly in how I said it, but those were the general thoughts. So now I'm looking at Mark Evans as a swing offensive lineman. That's his immediate role. Now the Saints have two offensive linemen, two offensive guards, because let's be real, he's going to be an offensive guard most likely. He had two offensive guards who are actually going into a contract year, meaning it's not guaranteed they'll be on the Saints next season. With that being the case, I'm not saying that Evans is going to come in and be a starter. That would actually shock me. However, as a swing lineman, if he can get there, I think there's actually a route to where he can start some games. What you have to look at, and you have to know the Saints for this, you have a left tackle, injury prone. Been in the league for a year, came in injured, played a couple games, got injured again. Kind of worried about that. You have a left guard who has been injury prone for almost a decade. Like, I know what I'm getting from Pete. I'm just Pete. That's the left guard. And he's probably going to miss some games. All Mark Evans has to do is outplay the fourth round draft pick, Salvadori. Saldaveri, excuse me. That's all he has to do. That's a guard, tackle, versatile chess piece on the offensive line. If he can outplay him, there's a very reasonable situation, hypothetical situation I could see happening where the left tackle and the left guard are gone and James Hurst, who is a, another li lineman for the Saints, and Mark Evans are on that left side. That is not crazy. All you have to do is outplay the fourth round pick. If you can be the secondary swing lineman behind James Hurst, then I think that there is a chance that Mark Evans gets some actual play time and not just, excuse me, when we say swing lineman, maybe I should define that. A swing lineman is basically a player who comes in, A, in relief of other players when injuries happen, and he can play a bunch of different positions, or they just come in when you need extra linemen, they just come in. And Mark Evans could be either one of those guys. Now you look at Shaq Davis, and Shaq Davis is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit different on how to get him to the roster. But he just needs to outplay A.T. Perry. And that was the sixth-round pick who a lot of people think is going to make the team. They felt like he should have been picked higher. But if Shaq Davis can outplay A.T. Perry, if he can do that, A, he made the team. B, he might actually get some reps. Now, there's two ways it can happen. You have to understand that teams don't keep more than six wide receivers. It's just, it's just very rare. I don't know if I've ever seen a team keep seven. Most teams keep five, and then you can bargain them up to six. I think that Perry and Davis are going to be fighting it out for that fifth wide receiver spot. The other way that Shaq Davis could make the roster is if Malik Flowers, a, who I think is going to get that sixth wide receiver spot because of his return abilities, comes into camp and just doesn't look like he can return. If it just looks like, well, Flowers, he's not as good of a return as we thought he was going to be, now you have room for A.T. Perry and Shaq Davis to take that fifth and sixth spot. However, if Flowers is a return specialist, then he'll be that guy who he doesn't play much offense, at least not at the beginning, but he'll be your kick returner. So technically, he'll count as a wide receiver that you're keeping on the roster, and that will be wide receiver number six. It's a very simple path, very simple path. 
outplay A.T. Perry. And none of that other stuff matters. If Shaq Davis outplays A.T. Perry, none of it matters. Mark Evans, he could make the, the roster even if he doesn't outplay Saldaveri. He just needs to be good enough to show he can be good depth on the offensive line. So I think Evans has a better chance to make it. He also got more money. I think Shaq Davis has a really good chance of making it. He just needs to outplay A.T. Perry. It's very simple to say, not so easy to do, but I look forward to seeing if they can accomplish it, and I likely will be at some point of New Orleans Saints camp, so I'll be able to report on these guys live and tell you exactly what I see from Metairie, Louisiana. I can't wait for that. It's a couple months away, but I cannot wait for that. In the meantime, I want to look into a little bit of sports psychology. I want to break down internal versus external pressure and really see what do you even consider to be pressure as we continue with Locked on HBCU. Before we get into that, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. And Built Bar is the number one protein bar on the market, bar none. And I don't care about any other protein bar that you bring to the table. It pales in comparison to Built. Listen, I used to try to bring Built Bars on here. I used to be like, okay, I'm going to do it. And every single time before I could bring it up for my, my ad read, I'd eat it. I ain't just want to show you an empty wrapper. Granted, that probably wasn't a great sales point. But the point is, I love me some Built. I really do, whether it's the Built Puff, whether it's the Built Bar. Even when we had the Built Granola, I loved every single one. I love the March Madness thing. They have so many nice innovations and different promotional tactics over there at Built. But listen, the thing that you need to know the most is where to get it. You can go to Walmart, go to Sam's Club, you can go to Built.com slash locked on. So if you can go in store, get it right now, or you can wait a little bit, get it shipped to you, and use the promo code LOCKED15. Yes, use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your offer when you go to built.com slash locked on. And as we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day. And remember, my everyday is we'll be back on Friday. Please drop a guy. You know, I might look for some players over the weekend that I want to talk about as far as their fit as a UDFA. But I would love to know who you are clamoring for, who you would like to hear a little bit of insight about and then I can go give you exactly what you want, right? So with that being said, let's look into a little bit of sports psychology and let's look at external pressure versus internal pressure. The reason I wanted to talk about this is because on yesterday's episode, which if you haven't checked out, please go do. I really enjoyed that episode. I felt like, I don't know what the reaction was because I purposely didn't look at the comments, but I was talking about the pressure that's on Davius Richard. And it doesn't mean that he is in a pass or fail situation. And this is another, uh, this is kind of similar to a situation I had earlier about TC Taylor. So I was just like, you know what? Let's talk about internal pressure versus external pressure, how I view it, what I think about it. And then also ask you, and the big question is, what is pressure? Matter of fact, is it pressure if you don't feel it? That's something I think is interesting. Is it pressure if you don't feel it? And that gets me to the first one, and that's external pressure. Both of those examples I just had were external pressure. That's pressure from outside, and that's not always felt, but I think it exists. I'll use the example first about TC. I said that TC Taylor was under pressure to make sure that people can't have the satisfaction of seeing Jackson State fall off after Dion left. I stand on that. But here's the thing. Even if they don't have a good year, it's not like TC is going to be fired. So what is the pressure? He might not feel that. He might not feel the need to not let anybody talk. You know, a wise man once told me, them people in there don't really care about what we talk about out here. But to me, that's a pressure. To me, I view heavy expectations as pressure a lot of the times. And external just means coming from someone who is not within the inner group. So with Jackson State, with Davius Richard, means somebody who's not within Jackson, not within Central, right? That's what it means. So you look at Davies Richard, I felt like there was pressure on him to live up to this, this, this label that they're giving him, that he's going to be the guy who breaks a 15-year drought. That's pressure to me. That's pressure. He might not feel it, but to me, pressure is pressure even if you don't feel it. It just means that you're cooler in the face of pressure. For example, a last-second shot is pressure no matter who's taking it, but some people just handle that better. Some people know how to look in the face of pressure and be cool as a cucumber. I'm dropping some real cliches today, but some people just have that ability. But does that, does that mean they weren't in a pressure situation? Does that mean that heavy expectations weren't put on top of them? I, I wouldn't say that. So I think pressure is pressure 
no matter how you react to it, no matter if you feed into it or not, that pressure is still existent. We'll love to know if you disagree, of course. But then you look at internal pressure. Now, internal pressure is almost always felt because a lot of people thought I was reaching when it came to TC. I heard a lot of Jackson State fans and they were defending TC. I wasn't taking any shots, but I understand what they're saying because I think they're focused on internal pressure and we all view it as that. See, let's say that you think a coach should be on the hot seat because he hasn't done this, that, and the third. If you don't believe that's the belief inside the organization, you might not say he's under any pressure. And I would understand that because that's internal pressure versus external pressure. And that's really the debate of the show. Also, when I do these psychology questions and these things like that, I always want to know what you think. I'm not I'm not a psychology professor. I took one class for a couple of months in the pandemic hit. So I would love to know what you think about it. Right. I'm not not perfect when it comes to this. Now, that being said, internal pressure is basically you're going to lose your job. That's something that T.C. Taylor didn't have. And I think that's one of the people that one of the reasons that people pushed back on me is because he didn't have that pressure of job security. Meanwhile, I remember when Sports Illustrated dropped an article talking about head coaches on the HBCU ranks who could be on the hot seat. That article is external pressure. If any single one of those things was true, that's internal pressure. I remember that Eddie George was on that list. Now, from the outside looking in, we might say we want more from Eddie George. We're putting pressure on him to succeed. You would say that. I'm putting pressure on Eddie George to succeed. But if the people inside Tennessee State aren't putting that pressure on Eddie George, is he under pressure in your book? Who knows? Internal pressure versus external pressure. And that's one of the things that I really do enjoy. We'll look into it a little bit deeper. We'll continue to talk about pressure, and maybe I'll define it. I don't have any inside sources, so I don't know anything internal pressure but if a report leaks then i can talk about it and that's how i'll be able to have internal discussion or internal pressure discussions as we continue on this journey because it's not just today it's not just tomorrow it's continuing on and on and on again so i hope you're continuing this journey with us we have one more stop we have one more bus stop to hit and that is talking about joe bryan because joe bryan has made yet another massive stride in his already massive offseason after leaving norfolk state and preparing for the nba draft We'll dive into that as we continue with Locked on HBCU. And as we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day I told you this episode is dedicated to my audio listeners, so thank you for making us your first listen of the day every day and making it all the way to segment three. I really do appreciate that. So thank you two times for that. You know the drill. One, three, two. We don't really count in order on this show, but it's okay because we're still going to count it up. Now, Joe Bryant is really having a huge offseason, and it's picking up even more steam as we speak. Now, here's the thing. We're going from one draft to another, NFL to NBA, but trust and believe I'm not about to predict anything. I'm not rubbing a crystal ball. I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not any of those things. I'm not predicting anybody to be selected or not be selected. I'm just looking at the fact that Joe Bryant, it feels like every other week I'm looking up And it's another big thing that he's accomplishing during the offseason. Now, I don't know where his stock was at the beginning of this offseason. I don't know where his stock is now. I don't try to predict it. I'm not even looking at that at the moment. I just want to stand back and just acknowledge what he has been able to do in this offseason. Let's look at it. Since the MEAC Men's Basketball Championship game, and that was the last game of his Spartan career, what has he done since then? Let's read that off. He went to the Reese's All-Star game. Followed it up, went to the HBCU All-Star Game. Followed that up, went to the PIT, right? So the Portmouth, Portsmouth Invitational Tournament. So he went to all of those things. And the latest thing that he's doing now, the latest step in Joe Bryant's huge offseason, he has been invited, excuse me, he has been invited to the NBA G League Elite Camp. This is big time. Now, of the things that he's already done, Mind you, because this camp is upcoming. But of the things that he's already done, that Reese's All-Star game was by far the biggest one. That Reese's All-Star game was one where I've said it before and I'll say it again because I think it's just so important to continue to speak on. But he had the best All-Star game performance that you could ask for from anybody in any sport. Now, every single All-Star game where you have a small school prospect, HBCU or not, but let's just focus on us. Any HBCU player who goes to an all-star game that's not all HBCUs, 
They're looking to show that they belong. That is literally the mission every single time. Ask any small school. Ask any HBCU. What did you want to accomplish when you came to the Senior Bowl, to the Reese's All-Star Game, to the NFLPA Bowl, to the Shrine Bowl? What are you trying to accomplish? I just want to show that I can play with these guys. I want you to know that this isn't my success isn't a part of my competition level. I want to show that I can come out here on the field or on the court and really compete with the best of the best. Pretty cookie cutter, but that's typically what you're going to hear. And that's exactly what the mission is nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten. That's exactly what you want to do. You're here to boost your stock. And for you, it's fighting a small school narrative. Well, Joe Bryant did more than than show he could belong. He showed he was the best player on the court. He was the Reese's All-Star MVP. I've seen players show themselves to be like, yeah, I can play with these guys. But I haven't seen an MVP. That's different. That's different. Definitely an overachiever. <laughs> but we appreciate the overachievement. Now, when you look at what's upcoming, this G League Elite Camp, now this is a different situation. Now you're going to be performing in front of NBA teams. Now you're going to be performing in front of G League teams. You're going to have pretty much every NFL or excuse me, every NBA team is going to be present at this event. And it's not uh, it's not like the HBCU All-Star Game. I know a lot of people feel like those things are for show or the HBCU Legacy Bowl or they're, they're there for show. This is a NBA G League Elite Camp. They're looking at people, whether that's going to be in the G League, whether that's going to be in the NBA. Matter of fact, within this event, within this competition, you're doing more than just showing off your skill set. You're also auditioning to be a part of the NBA Draft Combine. They're going to pull a select few players from this camp to be in the Combine. I think it might be the next day. Like This camp is the 13th and the 14th. I think that the Combine is then going to be the 15th and 16th, something like that. It's very soon after. Last year, you had three HBCU players who were in this. I believe it was Kyle Foster, MJ Randolph, and then also Bryson Gresham. You had those three players, and none of them were invited into this NBA draft combine after the camp. Well, with the way that Brian's been going on his offseason run, because he had good games in every single one of those events I had named, he just happened to be the MVP in one. So I labeled that above everything else. But outside of that, he's had great performances. The way he's been playing, he might earn that invite to the NBA draft combine. It'll be something that'll be interesting to watch. I believe that is next week, May 13th. To the 14th i know it's not this upcoming weekend though so i appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every day please enjoy your weekend it's friday please enjoy your weekend it's big five day you know a lot of people call it cinco de mayo but my favorite number is five so this day is dedicated to me today big five day now with all of that being said <laughs>